Thank you, musicians. Platform workers, good morning. Wonderful to see all of you. If you weren't here Wednesday, um, Lisa and I got back from Perth, Australia, ministering in the conference there. And a fantastic time. They planted 12 churches and in uh, nine of them were international, one into a new nation, the Seychelles. The island of the Seychelles is a brand new nation, but fantastic what God is doing in Australia. They are bursting at the seams, have to enlarge their building to be able to accommodate the conference. So uh, we are very, very glad to be back. We sent, uh, just before we go into the message this morning, we sent Anthony and Natalie uh, Cassio to Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, shortly after arriving, they got a house. They were coming back, I believe, from uh, attending a revival in, in Malden. A drunk plowed through an intersection and hit them and totaled their car. And uh, so this is not good, but when Anthony went to the dealership to ha had to buy a new car, he met a young man from Brazil, witnessed to him, he got saved. Last night, I wanna show you a, a photo Last night, he brought his girlfriend. They had their first Bible study in Starbucks. And uh, his girlfriend got saved. And so God used something bad into something good. And we thank God for what he's doing. We need to thank God for that. Thank God. Amen. You pray for them as they're laboring in Boston. If you have your Bibles, turn in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel chapter 47, Ezekiel 47, when Israel declared independence in 1948, much of Israel, the bulk of Israel actually was just a vast desert. I actually have a photo from 1948. This is farming. That is what Israel looked like in 1948. Even though it's black and white, you can see it was desert. Um, David Ben-Gurion, he urged Israelis, make the desert bloom. He said, all the desert lacked is Jews and water. And if we had Jews and water, we can make the desert bloom. They began to understand desalination, taking salt out of the seawater. They developed drip irrigation technology. Much of drip irrigation technology came from Israel. Rainwater harvesting, recycling. They learned many things. And what, what happens in many places in the world is the desert is encroaching. The deserts are getting larger and taking over green areas. Not so in Israel. So successful have their... Uh, efforts been to make the desert bloom. Israel's the only nation where the desert has receded from anywhere from 15 up to 60 miles. Let me show you a picture of what Israel looks like today. That is what Israel looks like now because they have made a difference. What made the difference was water. Wherever there is water, there is life. Ezekiel 47 is a puzzling uh, chapter, it talks about this temple, is that a real temple, whatever. But the important thing we're going to focus on is not whether it's literal or when is it going to be built. The real issue is our text speaks about water that flows from the temple and everywhere the water flows, it brings life. So I want to preach, this is a, a principle that we're going to learn. God wants to speak to you about water's of life. Let's read Ezekiel 47. We're going to read uh, starting in verse 1. We'll skip through the chapter 1 through 5. He brought me to the, back to the door of the temple and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east for the front of the temple faced to east and the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. He brought me out by the way of the north gate led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faces east and there was water running out on the right side when the man went uh, out to the east with a line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits, brought me through the waters. The water came up to my ankles. He measured another 1,000, brought me through the waters. It came up to my knees, measured 1,000, brought me through, and it came up to my waist and another 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross. The water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. 
Skipping to verse 8, he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley, enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, whether, uh, wherever the ri li rivers go, will live. There will be a great multitude of fish because these waters go there. They will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. Verse 12, along the bank of the river and this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food, that their leaves will not wither, the fruit will not fail, they will bear fruit every month because the water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves will be for medicine. Waters of life. Let's begin. I want to look at the place of the water. Our text speaks about not just water. This is miracle water. Life giving water that has the power to change things. And the Bible says, where do you find this water? It flows from the temple. Verse 1. Water was flowing from the right side of the temple. In the Old Testament, the temple was a meeting place with God. Exodus 25, 22, there I will meet with you and I will speak to you. This has always been God's plan. God has a place where people can meet with God. We know that God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at the same time. But he's not ministering, doing things everywhere God has always chosen specific places that he can meet with people. They can meet with him. And uh, there is something in the temple that they receive revelation. In the temple, they understood who God was. He showed himself. Showed them things about himself. Showed about themselves. Talked about the future. Genesis 35, 1, God said to Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God. So a meeting place. This started with what was called the tabernacle. A tabernacle was literally a fancy tent. It was a movable tent. God had a command he gave to Moses. I want to meet with people in a specific location. And that is going to be in this tent. Wherever that tent is, that is where people could meet with God. Exodus 25, 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I can dwell among them. And then it moved from the tent to the temple. Now they finally built a building. David planned for it. Solomon built it. It was a permanent structure, but it had the exact same idea, a place where people can meet with God. We now live in the New Testament era. In the New Testament, the place where God meets with people more than any other place is the church. Jesus revealed God's great plan of the church, which is not a building. It's a gathering of people. The word literally means a gathering of people they gather to hear a message from the king. In Matthew 16, 18, on this rock, I will build my church. That's the gathering of people they gather to hear from the king. See, at church, many things can happen. Some of you here, you appreciate we have church services because it's now your dating site, right? It's where you meet boys and, and, and girls. But there can be many things that happen at church. Others are here to make money, socialize. But you need to catch why we have church. We have church to create a place where people can meet with God. There are people sitting here. It was in a church service where you were saved from sin. It was in a church service. Some of you were delivered from uh, habits and evil spirits. People in church, your body has been healed in the past. Some of you found direction for your life. What am I supposed to do? Pastor Jesse is talking about purpose. Some of you found that purpose for your life in church. Others of you, when you're grieving, it's in church that you have found comfort to and many different things acts 13 to they as they ministered to the lord and fasted the holy spirit said now separate 
to me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. I want to say something to you. There are supernatural things that God only does to the church. We're reading an Old Testament picture. It is meant to be symbolic. It's not literal, it's symbolic. Water brings life. The temple has a flow of life-giving water. And that is a place where people meet with God. Never lose sight of this. Some of you come to church so much, maybe you have forgotten. There are supernatural things that God does only through the church. Revelations 1, 12 and 13, I saw seven golden lampstands in the midst of the seven lampstands. I saw the Son of Man. Here in Revelations, where is Jesus? The lampstands were representative of seven churches. Jesus is in the midst of the church. And the lampstands, those kind of lamps, they were not electric. They were lampstands that had oil. And you know that oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So you put those together. There is a supernatural work that God does in the church like no other place. You can pray anywhere. You can read your Bible anywhere. But God does things in the church supernaturally that do not take place any other place like they do at church. Verse 1, the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple. And what you see here, this water was not ordinary water. It did a miracle. Everything that water touched came alive. The Bible says there were things that were healed when the water came in, in uh, uh, touch with them. John 7, 37, from their innermost being will flow rivers of living water, or we could say life-giving water. I want them to put a picture up on the screen. On the screen, that man in the center, his name is Stephen Westby. He was a heart surgeon in England, and he would operate if he could operate, but there were people that were simply too sick to live long enough to be able to get a heart transplant or they were too sick to even survive a heart transplant. When he went and attended a medical convention, that man on the left kneeling down, he met him at the convention. His name is Stephen Jarvik. Stephen Jarvik had invented an external heart pump. And he was in charge, and he's an American, he was in charge of distributing these in the United States. Stephen Westby was from England. When he met Stephen Jarvik at that convention, now he had an answer for his patients that could never survive surgery. That man on the right is Peter Houghton. He was the first recipient of an external heart pump. He would have died had Stephen Westby not met, or uh, uh, had not met uh, Robert Jarvik. So th that is interesting to me. At a certain place, he met someone who could help him. That is exactly what church is all about. There are people here this morning, you came in bound by sin, you can find help in church. There are people, you need deliverance, you can find help in church like no other place. And so the Bible says there is a place of the water. Let's talk secondly about the spread of the water because this is the second thing our text speaks about. Human nature is often like this. We get something good and we want to keep it for ourselves. Supernatural things even we often want to keep for ourselves. In the Old Testament, the Bible says God gave them miracle food. It was called manna. It suddenly appeared on the ground. But human nature, people would hoard it for themselves. Peter went up with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. A supernatural miracle. Jesus begins to shine. Moses and Elijah met him there. And Peter blurts out, this is great. Let's just live here. I'll build a place where we can all live Let's just stay here. I have experienced something wonderful and I would just like to stay with it here. But the problem is 
There were people down the mountain who needed that. The Jerusalem saints, the Bible says that they were, had been given a command, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. But the Bible says what was actually happening after the day of Pentecost is they were so excited they were having such a wonderful time with the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. They stayed in Jerusalem. And they stayed there until Acts chapter 8, persecution finally forced them to leave. So in point one, life-giving miracle water flowed from the temple. That's the church. But the second thing our text says the pattern for spiritual health is that the water needs to spread. It should not stay in the temple. The origination is in the temple. That's where it starts. But it should go beyond the temple. Verse 1, the water was flowing from the right side of the temple. Verse 2, there was water running out on the right side. So the Bible says... When you experience the life-giving water, the power of the Holy Spirit that God touches you in church, he says, don't keep it in church. It needs to flow beyond church. Give it out. We give out through evangelism. The people who are truly converted, they want other people to have what they had uh, the other night I, I had heard while I was gone that Flavio and Liz that they were bringing people Flavio was able to bring his family to church and brought them to church in Phoenix able to bring some here and that is a natural part he wants his family to experience the same life that he has that's a normal part of conversion Acts 1 8 you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem Judea Samaria and unto the end of the earth every time we evangelize every time we go on the streets every time we hold an outreach somewhere we are giving out and that is what the miracle life is meant to do we give out through ministry Luke 8, 46, I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. Jesus had been ministering. He had been teaching, helping people. He had been praying for the sick. And he says there, virtue has gone out of me. Anytime you get involved in God's work to help other people, you are giving out. But you see, giving out is very healthy. Do you know that Often the healthiest Christians are those who witness and those who are involved in some kind of ministry in the church because it is good for you to give out. I have another picture I want you to put up on the screen. This man's name is Ernest Boyd. In the 1990s, he started donating blood. But what's interesting about him why is he donating blood? Because other people need help. I want to save your life, so I'm going to donate some of my blood. But he has an interesting story. He said, donating blood has saved my life several times. Once, while he was donating blood, his heart stopped. He didn't know he had a heart condition. But he, at the moment his heart stopped, he was in a clinic. That's a good place to be doctors and nurses around, great place to be if your heart's going to stop. So his life was saved. They were able to revive him. They discovered, they tested, found out he had a heart condition. He didn't even know he had it. And then because of the heart problem, the doctor said, we want to do a, a range of tests. While testing him, not only did he have a heart problem he didn't know, because he had collapsed in the clinic while testing, uh, while donating blood, they found out during the test that he also had lung cancer and he had no idea. So think about that. He said, because of this, uh, uh, they were able to treat the cancer. And then he said, even though I have been sick, I want to keep donating blood. And he found out in further testing, he had very low levels of calcium and that was what actually caused the heart issue in the first place so he said giving out 
actually saved my life. That is true. Listen, God never meant you to be a bundle of spiritual selfishness. There are that I, I have a relationship with Jesus. It's just me and the Lord. I know, and no one gets the benefit. Those people go kooky over time. I've met some people that are like, I'm very close to the Lord. And like, you're very strange. That's what you are. <laughs> it is just healthy for believers to witness. It is healthy for believers to be involved. You know, there's something else. Not only do we want to keep it to ourselves, the other thing about human nature is people like to stay at their current level. You know, we get comfortable with things that we know. And so we tend to stay there. I, I told you probably many times, but years ago, Lisa and I were pastoring in Melbourne, Australia. It's a cosmopolitan city, world-class cuisine. You can eat some of the finest food from any place on the globe. I had an evangelist come and preach for me. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, he wanted to eat at McDonald's. Why? Because it was familiar. Listen, there's curry, there's satay. There, I mean, there's noodles there. I mean, there are wonderful foods there. Nope, McDonald's, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Because it was on the final night, I rebelled. I took him to a fine restaurant on the 35th floor of the Rialto Tower. I mean, it was fantastic. You know what he ordered? A hamburger. It was expensive, but that, to him it was safe. That, that's a sad way to live, but that's how people live their life with God. They get to a comfortable level where there is no danger of ever being embarrassed. This is how some people look. They look at the water and they say, if I don't get in, I can never sink. I'll never be embarrassed. There's no danger of cost. It won't cost them anything in relationships. It won't cost them financially. It won't cost them by having to change their plans. Shallow water is where you stay in control. Matthew 16, 22, Jesus tells about his plan of going to the cross. And Peter said, he began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Peter didn't understand the cross. He said, I don't like the cross. I want to stay in control. But our text says the water needs to spread. But the next thing it says, the water should get deeper and you should get in deeper water. Verse 3 through 6, measured 1,000 cubits. The water came up to my ankles. Another thousand, it came up to my knees. Another thousand, it came up to my waist. Another thousand, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep. So in this, here is God or the angel of God, however you interpret this being that is helping him. What is it that God wants Ezekiel to do? Go deeper. You know, there are some people like, I went to the ocean it was, but you only went up to your ankles. You did not experience the full ocean, ankle deep. And so here the Bible says, God took him. If you're not in at all, get in. And it came up to his ankles. Great, but don't stay there. This is God. Go deeper. It went up to his knees. Go deeper up to his waist. That is our call. Whatever level you are at in God, God says, don't stay there. Go deeper. God has more than toe deep or ankle deep. God has more for you in usefulness. He has more in relationship than just a shallow uh, relation, uh, relationship that you can have with him. Here's a quote. God always answers us in the deeps, never in the shallows of our soul. Colossians 4 17, say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry of the Lord that you've received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. Archippus, you have started, God started something in you. He said, don't stop. Get in. 
Do everything that God wants you to do because this is God's will for our lives is the water should spread and we should go deeper. Final thought that we look from our text. Let's talk about the power of the water. In this text... It shows the results. What happens when the water that begins, we could say, in church? What happens when it touches people's lives? The results, our text says, water brings life. Wherever the supernatural power of God touches... It changes things. When it reaches the sea, the waters are healed. Verse 8. Verse 9. Every living thing that moves will live when the water goes there. Multitude of fish, because the water goes there, they'll be healed. Everything will live where the water, the river goes. Listen. If God is truly at work in your life, something should change. There's miracle power. When Lisa and I pastored in Johannesburg, South Africa, man came to a revival meeting and I met him and he began to tell me he was an evangelist. He was talking about how God powerfully used him and God is powerfully moving and the Holy Spirit is powerfully, everything was powerful. And then he said, can I talk to you for a minute? He said, would you pray for me? And I said, for what? He said, would you pray that God would help me to quit smoking? So you're powerfully, you have such a powerful relationship with the Holy Spirit, you can't even quit smoking? I mean, isn't that kind of basic that something should change in your life? And if you're smoking here this morning, I'm not saying that to condemn you. I'm saying there's power to change things. You need a miracle in your life because in our text, when the water touches, when the Holy Spirit touches something, it brings life. Look at the impact of the life-giving water. Number one, the water brings healing. Verse 8, when it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. I want to tell you, God can bring supernatural healing. He can bring physical healing. Mark 16, 8, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. God can heal sick and injured and diseased people. God can bring emotional healing. There are people that they have been traumatized in life. You don't have to stay that way forever. God can do a miracle in you and bring healing. God brings healing in relationships. I preach Wednesday. Conflicts can be resolved. Marriages can be restored because the water brings healing. Number two, the water brings life. Every living thing that moves wherever the river goes, it will live. When the Holy Spirit touches a human heart, life is brought. You know why this is important is over time, there are people that they feel dead inside. Their spiritual life has waned. Maybe they've gotten into sin. Maybe over time they've neglected or maybe just time itself. But they're coming to church and they no longer have an appetite. They come to church and they feel dead inside. But the Bible says when the water touches, it brings life. This is the marvel. This is why Lisa and I, uh, uh, we often say to each other, we hear of someone who has been making wrong decisions for a long time, but God has done a miracle in them. Young man that we used to pastor in South Africa, Jonathan sent me a photo of him. After not doing right, God is bringing life into his soul. And we say, that's why you don't give up on people. Pastor told me the other night of someone who has neglected their calling for I don't remember, 20, 25 years. But he said, this year, God's done a miracle. And that man says, now I want to preach. Life is coming. I want to tell you, you do not have to stay cold and dead inside. God can do a miracle in you. 
Ezekiel 37, 5, this is what the Lord says to the bones. I will cause breath to enter so you will come to life. Thirdly, the water brings fruitfulness. Verse 12, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on the banks of the river and their fruit, or every month they will bear because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food, leaves for healing. You know what? God is able to bring a miracle of fruitfulness. Some of you have witnessed, but you don't see results for that. I want to tell you that's not okay. God can do a miracle. He can cause you to be fruitful. He can transform so that when you witness someone is powerfully converted and wants to live for Jesus, John 15, 16, I chose you and appointed you that you should bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Fourthly, the water brings productivity. Verse 10, fishermen will stand by it. There'll be places for spreading their nets. This is what happens when God touches people, whether it's a new convert, or whether it's the reviving of someone who has gone cold, is they become useful. God causes them to get involved and do God's will. That is what God wants to do. And it's all a miracle of life-giving water. See, there's a miracle dimension that happens in deep water. Psalm 107, 23 and 24, others went out to sea in ships and did business on the great or the deep oceans. They saw what the Lord could do and the miracles he did in the deep oceans. Listen, my, my challenge to you in this message, go deeper. Wherever you're at, you've gotten to a comfortable level. I know what if I go and I'm, I'm a little nervous? So what? Go deeper. Because it is in the deep, there is, there is incredible value in going deeper. Final photo I want them to put up on the screen. Bluefin tuna are some of the rarest tuna fish. And the reason why is you only catch bluefin tuna in deep water. Bluefin tuna can dive to a depth of 3,000 feet under the surface. But when you catch a bluefin tuna in, in Japan, when they catch them, they hold an auction. So valuable are these fish, when they land at the dock, they immediately hold an auction. Who wants to buy this fish? The picture I have there is a bluefin tuna that was caught in 2019. That fish weighs 612 pounds. The moment that the ship docked, they held an auction. That fish sold for $3 million. That's some expensive sushi. They're not selling that fish at Golden Corral. I'm just saying. It will never be a McFish <laughs> at McDonald's. Why is it so expensive? Because you only find it in the deep. You're not going to find a powerful relationship with God in the shallows. That's why God, the water got deeper. My challenge to you, go deeper. You've been saved a short amount of time. Get all in. Let God use your life. Some of you, you've been around for a long time. You're just kind of waiting there with your arm floaties. Go deeper. <laughs> Go deeper. Because there are valuable things, wonderful things. Life-giving water, and it's in the deep. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes all across this place. While our heads are bowed, I am giving a challenge. Some of you have never experienced the life-giving water that I was preaching about. Christianity is not a program. It's not just a class. It is not merely church attendance. Christianity begins with a miracle. Christianity is based on the greatest miracle of all. Jesus died on the cross 
and then he rose from the dead. Miracle power. That is what happens when a person is born again. When they turn from their sin and they ask God to be a part of their life, come into my heart. God brings life. He brings miracle power. Jesus called it being born again. It's a miracle. Some of you here have never experienced that miracle. You don't know what it's like to live and feel clean on the inside, to sleep without being tormented in your conscience. Some of you don't know what it's like to be free from habits and sin that plague and seem to have you chained. God can do a miracle in you. And I'm asking how many people here, if you would be honest with God about your great need, God, I am a sinner. I have broken your commands, but I believe in Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for my sin. I want to turn from my sin, come in and do a miracle in me. If you've never done that, made a decision to leave your sin, you could do that before you leave here. You don't have to take a course. I'm not selling anything. I'm asking who would like to pray and be born again, have God forgive them and change them from the inside out. If you're here this morning and you're not right with God, if you want to pray and turn from your sin, I want you to do one thing. Lift up your hand while everyone else has their head bowed Lift your hand up. I see that hand. God bless you. This young man, how many others? I want to get right with God. Lift your hand up so I can see it. I'm not born again, but that's what I want. Hold your hand up. I need Jesus. I want to come to God. Some of you are backslidden. You were saved in the past, but you went back to sin. God has not given up on you. Backslider, lift up your hand. I want to come home. I want God to do a miracle in me. Thank you. I see that hand. How many others? I want to get right with God. Unsaved or backslidden, never done this before, or you did and you went back to sin. But this morning, I want to get right with God. Hold your hand up so I can see it. Anybody else? Quickly, we're going to do other things. I want to get right with God. I need Jesus. Lift up your hand right now. I need God to do a miracle in me. Thank God. I want those that lifted their hand, look up at me. Did you mean that? Yes. You want to get right with God back there? You want to get right with God? Yes. Come here, out of your seat. God bless you. That one there, you saw who that was. You bring them, help them. I want the rest of you to stand up to your feet. I'm inviting you to come to the altar. Some of you, you need to make a decision. God, I'm not going to hold it for myself. I'm going to witness others. I'm going to get involved. Some of you, you need a miracle of life. You have grown cold and dead on the inside. Come to the altar and say, God, I don't want to say like this. Do a miracle. Let life-giving water flow in my soul so that I can live for you. Thank God. They're going to sing while people are coming. There is a river <clears throat> that flows from deep within. There is a fountain that frees the soul from sin. Come, Come to, to the waters, there is a vast supply. There is, is a river that never shall a river there is a river oh, God help that us flows from deep within there is a fountain that frees the soul from sin come to There is a river 
And I want you to bow your heads. There are some of you that you're at the altar because you recognize on the inside there is no longer life that was at work at one time. You know, one of the simplest prayers you could pray is, God, give me a hunger. Give me a hunger. It, it cannot be, it, there's something to be said for duty, do right, even if you don't feel like it, but you can't live like that forever. Some of you at the altar, you need to pray, God, give me a hunger. Make me hungry for your word. Make me hungry. Make me want to come to church. Put a holy desire in me to pray, to do your will. That is a prayer that God would love to answer. He is able to do a miracle in it. I want you to say this out loud. Say, God, do a miracle in me. Put hunger in my soul for good things make me hungry for the word of god for prayer and church and evangelism let there be holy desires revive me on the inside touch my soul with life-giving water of the holy spirit and i thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. Let's praise God together right now. God, I thank you. Holy Spirit, come down and meet with us right now. I need you to touch these hearts, bring life. I speak life into their souls. Life, Lord God, revive and quicken their hearts and their lives in Jesus' name. Let's give God a clap offering for his goodness. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you for what you're going to do, Lord God. Thank you for miracle power. Praise God for his goodness. Amen. God wants to help us. He's going to do a miracle. Thank God. We are going to be dismissed. New converts, I want to remind you, at 5 p.m. in the front uh, foyer, the entryway, we have a new believers class called Foundations for the Faith. 5.30, we're going to pray. Some of you, if you prayed, you want God to revive you. Then now, put legs on your prayers and be here at